the first case we're going to talk about is a golden retriever who presented for a five month history of um, alopecia and scale. Um, the dog wasn't pretty and there wasn't really any other systemic signs to note. Um, this is our dog here, not looking too much like a golden retriever at this point. Um, so we've got quite a lot of um, alopecia. Um, and um, in the next photo, um, we can see that we've got quite a lot of adherent scale there going on too. Um, any differentials at this point for this dog? Yep, hypothyroidism, I like it. Anything else? Yep, perfect. Yeah, who said that? That's a really good differential. So anytime you see kind of adherent scale like that, um, I definitely have sebaceous adenitis on your list as a differential. Um, so these are the differentials that I had here. So um, I'd put Hyper A on there as well. Um, I think some, you know, without PUPD, it makes it very unlikely. But I think sometimes owners are not particularly fabulous at um, appreciating a PUPD. Um, sebaceous adenitis, cutaneous lymphoma can also cause um, alopecia and scale. Um, although cutaneous lymphoma is usually pruritic. Um, and then potentially sex hormone or vitamin A responsive conditions. Um, so these are the test results here. So thyroid values, high normal, so not hypothyroid. Um, the rest of the blood work was pretty unremarkable and skin scrapings were negative and cytology was pretty unremarkable. So um, what should our next diagnostic test be? Skin biopsy maybe? Yeah, perfect. Um, so, um, some, and some of these tests are done before the patient um, arrives with me. So, um, a dermatophyte culture um, is potential, although the amount of times I've seen dermatophytes in a dog is almost non-existent. I mean, I can count them on one hand. I think dermatophytes are pretty uncommon and um, in dogs. And when I do see them in dogs, it's usually little Jack Russells with trichophyton. Um, I've seen M. Canis maybe once or twice in dogs. And maybe that's because you guys do such a good job and they never make it to me. But I think it's um, fairly rare. Um, and then tests for hyper A, so a low dose DEX test maybe. Um, skin biopsy. And then um, as far as treating with antibiotics go, we'd previously said that we'd done some cytology, which was pretty unremarkable. But if it looks like a pyoderma, I'd treat it like a pyoderma, even if you're not seeing bacteria, because um, sometimes we're not seeing large amounts of bacteria cytologically. Um, versus malassezia, if you think it's a yeast infection and you don't see yeast, it's not yeast because they're pretty easy to find. So um, I think a treatment trial with antibiotics is never a bad idea. Um, and then potentially a hypoallergenic diet in case there was a food allergy component, maybe. Um, so the dermatophyte culture had been done, which was negative. Um, the dog was not hyper A and skin biopsy showed a lack of sebaceous glands. So we have sebaceous adenitis. Um, so sebaceous adenitis um, is seen relatively commonly and um, the breed predispositions of Wieslers, Akitas, Poodles, Larsers, and we're not 100% sure why it happens. Scaling and alopecia are the most common signs that we see um, and often you'll get secondary pyodermas too. Um, so once again, this is a close up of the um, scale and it's very adherent. So I'm gonna show you another picture here. This is, you can literally just pluck these hairs out of the dogs and they'll have this um, kind of material on the bottom of the hair there. And we call that follicular plugging or follicular casting. Um, and it's not 100% diagnostic for sebaceous adenitis, but it should make you pretty suspicious that that's what you could be dealing with. And this is what it looks like under the microscope. So we have our hair shaft there and then we have all of that sort of keratin um, that's adherent to the hair shaft there. Um, and this is what it looks like histologically. So um, this is the top of the skin here and this is a hair follicle here. And usually the hair follicle should be associated with a sebaceous gland, which looks like a um, little bunch of grapes. And here we're not seeing sebaceous glands, but we are seeing inflammatory cell infiltrates where the sebaceous glands would have been. And so treatment options, there's a spectrum of treatment options. And I always say when there's more than one or two treatments, it's because none of them work 100%. So um, it, I kind of decide how I'm going to treat these um, mostly based on the owner's finances because um, vitamin A has been reported to be effective and it's relatively inexpensive, but it's not as effective as cyclosporin or synthetic retinoids, um, which are more expensive. Um, and then topical therapy can be quite important too. So using anti shampoos that help to kind of normalize the turnover um, of the skin. 
Steroids have been used. I've never found steroids to be effective for sebaceous adenitis at all. Um, and hypoallergenic diets, I think the reason that people have reported efficacy with those is because they usually have high concentrations of fatty acids. So I think um, all of those fatty acids are beneficial to the skin. Um, and then uh, emollient oil soak. So um, with cases of sebaceous adenitis, I find it really helpful for the owners to um, apply baby oil to the dogs, um, but they're also going to need to remove it. So to remove baby oil, um, Dawn dishwashing liquid will do a really nice job of that, um, but they usually need to do two cycles of that. Um, so I get them to put the baby oil on, um, leave it on for 10 minutes or so, and then wash twice with Dawn dishwashing liquid every seven to 10 days. And to be honest, in a lot of cases, that'll make them look pretty fabulous after one of those baths. Um, as far as vitamin A goes, um, the doses used for um, small and large dogs are there and if it's going to work, it should work within six weeks. So if you wanted to try vitamin A for six weeks, um, I think that's fine. But if you're not seeing an improvement at that point, I wouldn't persist because it's not going to get any better. Um, it is important to monitor um, tear production because using the high doses of vitamin A can cause um, dry eye. Um, I usually have the owners do it at home. I teach them how to do a Sherma tear test and I have them do it once a week at home and then just um, text or email email me with the results. Um, Sarcosporin is definitely the treatment of choice and I just um, use it at 5 mg per kg. I know some people use it a little bit higher, ranging up to the 10 mg per kg, but I think 5 is plenty. Um, and then the dose, um, it's really important to review it because with cyclosporin you can um, usually taper the dose and sometimes we can get these dogs down to twice a week. So I'll usually review them um, every 6 to 8 weeks and um, at that point review, um, reduce the dose if they're doing well. And I say preferably use atopica because with the compounded cyclosporin, um, I think sometimes the response is very variable. And if at the end of say eight weeks or so, the dog's not doing well, I'm not gonna be sure whether that's because I used a compounded product or um, whether because it's not gonna work for that dog. And there have been studies done in the US where um, they've gone to um, compounding pharmacies anonymously and submitted prescriptions for cyclosporin. And there was another study that did it for the azole drugs. Um, and then they analysed the actual content of drug that was available in those compounded products and it was really variable. So I don't think we can 100% rely on what we're getting in those um, products. Um, always important to treat the um, secondary infections and I don't think many of us are using um, TMS these days unless we have methicillin resistant bacteria but um, just bear in mind that that can also lead to dry eye. So if we're giving that in combination with vitamin A we're probably setting ourselves up for a bit of a disaster. Um, so I think the important thing here is that um, that dog looked a lot like it was hypothyroid to me um, initially um, and so sebaceous adenitis looks very much like an endocrinopathy and um, if in doubt always take a skin biopsy. Um, so this one is a really cool case. It was a four-year-old um, cat that was found as a stray and it had a little bit of a scratch on its nose and um, a two-year history of an ulcer that um, was slowly getting bigger and bigger. Um, the owners didn't have any lesions and I think that's always an important question to ask and none of, um, there were no other pets in the household. So this is the cat there. It's really um, sad to think you let that go on for two years, don't you? Um, so the previous vet had performed a biopsy just before the um, cat came to me and there was a lot of um, inflammation. So pyogranulomatous inflammation is neutrophils and macrophages, um, but they didn't see any organisms. Um, so, as far as what could potentially be causing that, any time you see pyogranulomatous inflammation, I think that you need to be thinking about something infectious. So neutrophils and macrophages are not always there for infectious agents, but they um, often are. Um, it could potentially be a sterile process because we didn't see any infectious agents on our histo. Um, mycobacteria can be difficult to find, potentially fungal um, or potentially a cancerous process. I think a squamous cell carcinoma could easily look like that. Um, and so the next step here, um, I don't think there's any harm in ever repeating a skin biopsy. And I think it's a really hard sell when you're trying to tell an owner to do a test that they've already paid for. Um, but how I kind of explain it is that taking a skin biopsy is like taking a photo of a moving train. We're not always gonna catch the skin in the same sort of cycle. So we may get a completely, uh, completely different response if we repeat a biopsy. Although if we repeat it, we're probably gonna wanna do some cultures as well. Um, so tissue cultures um, for anything that looks like that, I think are important. 
important. And to be honest, for any nodular skin disease, if you're taking a sample for histo, I'd take a sample for bacterial and fungal culture as well. Um, and then, um, or you could potentially treat with steroids based on the fact that it was, um, there were no organisms seen previously, or these owners were at the point where they were considering euthanasia as well. <coughs> Um, so the skin biopsy showed the same thing. That's always a fun chat when you tell the owners that we've um, repeated and everything's the same. Um, the bacterial culture had mixed growth. Um, and when there's mixed growth, it's usually not the actual cause. Um, it's usually just secondary contamination. And our fungal culture showed sporo. So um, it was really nice that we were able to pick that up. And um, you can imagine had we treated this cat with um, steroids, the fungal disease would have gotten much worse, potentially. Um, so Sporo um, is worldwide in distribution. It's also, um, you've probably heard it as the rose growers disease um, in humans. Um, it is more common in cats and there's usually some sort of history of trauma. So whether there's been, um, you know, um, a, a cat fight potentially or um, of the one, one of the other cats that I've treated that had a lesion on the leg had jumped a fence and got its leg caught on the fence. Um, and cytology in cats, you can often pick up the sporo, but not always, just on cytology without even needing to do a biopsy. Um, and I've got some pictures of that here. So we've got the neutrophils here and then we've got macrophages and we've got these kind of yeast-like organisms that are there. Um, and this is what sporo looks like on a culture, so kind of like a portobello mushroom. Um, and then as far as treatment goes, um, I've mostly used itraconazole um, in Australia, but in the US I used fluconazole because it was much cheaper. Um, I've never used tibinafin, um, but studies have reported tibinafin to be effective. And um, out of all the drugs I think we have in Australia, if the owners did have cost concerns, um, tibinafin would probably be the cheapest out of all of those options. Um, and then um, treatment is a really, really long duration, so much longer than you think it's going to be. And in humans, um, they can develop a cutaneous um, lymphatic form, and those humans are often on um, antifungals for the rest of their lives. So um, it is important to do um, a very long duration or it will recur. Um, and I usually monitor liver enzymes in cats when I have them on azoles. Um, to be honest, I've rarely had any problems um, when I'm monitoring liver enzymes, but I think it's important to do it. Um, so I'll usually take um, a baseline blood sample before starting them and then check every four to six weeks. Um, so this is the cutaneous lymphatic form um, in humans. Not very nice at all. So this is our cat before treatment. And this is one month after starting fluconazole. So pretty quick turnaround. Cat's looking pretty normal now. Um, and that's four months after starting fluconazole. So these owners were really, really happy. Um, and so I think the important thing with that one is um, that cat looked like it was pretty bad to me. And to be honest, I actually thought we were going to be heading down the um, neoplastic um, route. Um, and the owners were very keen on euthanasia when they came to me. Um, but fortunately, we were able to convince them otherwise. Um, and Marilyn and I had a case out um, who um, presented with um, uh, kind of um, deep uh, lesions that looked like they should be infectious um, but in the end it was a sterile process and responded well to immunosuppression but then we gave him a fungal infection with all of our immunosuppression. <laughs> Um, so the third case we have here is um, a, this. Oh, I love this one. This one is a um, wire fox terrier had a progressive um, non pruritic alopecia and had a, a prepuce um, that had linear erythema and hyperpigmentation. Any thoughts as to what this guy could have? Sorry. Something that I like yeah, potentially. Good. Um, and so. Um, this is him here. Looks pretty terrible, but kind of cute. Um, and so, um, th he does look like a Chinese crested. So this is his prepuce here, and this is the linear area of um, erythema. And it's very uncommon to see a linear area of erythema on the prepuce. And this is a lighter dog here, so you can just kind of subtly appreciate it there. Um, so whenever the, um, a dog has testicles and there's a linear area of erythema on the prepuce, you can almost diagnose the dog without doing anything further. Um, and so um, in most cases, it's going to be a testicular associated neoplasia and most commonly a Sertoli cell tumour. Um, and there's not any other diseases that will cause that linear area of erythema. Um, maybe the dog's hyper-A, maybe it's hyperthyroid, maybe it's something else that does seem pretty slam dunk. 
Um, so as far as what we do next, um, most of these things are actually done. Um, so firstly, cytology of the area. So um, if you do cytology normally, and this is a tape prep, these are normal nucleated um, keratinocytes or epithelial cells. We're not 100% sure why, but when they have Sertoli cell tumours in some, but not all cases, um, you'll get these non-nucleated kind of cornified cells. The last two that I've had didn't have this, um, so it's nice if it's there, but it's not always there. Um, the blood work and chest x-rays were normal. Um, abdo ultrasound wasn't done at that time. Um, and the castration showed lots of little tumours in those testicles. And so um, this is a case that um, Sarah had, was it today that you had one? Um, so it was really nice that we spoke about it on um, Monday or Tuesday, Tuesday. Um, and then she had a case of it in the clinic. Um, so recheck four months later, the dog looks worse. No, not like in those cases, no. Um, but um, the last two that I've had, I was able to palpate the tumours. Um, and so, I mean, the tumours don't have to be huge. Um, they can be very, very small. Um, and a lot of the time, I'll usually, before we do the castration, often we'll just ultrasound the testicles really quickly to identify the tumours. Um, but yeah, it's definitely always a good idea to thoroughly palpate them, but not always will you be able to feel them. Um, so this is the dog after we've taken the <laughs> testicles off. <laughs> <laughs> Looks worse than it did before. <laughs> um, so, what do we think? Of, yeah, <laughs> good one. What do we think could be wrong with this dog now? Maybe an endocrinopathy. That's good potentially. So, um, next thing, the uh, dermatophyte culture was negative. Although I don't know how they actually obtained the culture in that case because there wasn't a lot of hair to culture. Um, and then the skin biopsy showed a lot of lymphocytes around the hair follicles. So this dog actually had alopecia areata, which is extremely rare. Um, and when I did my resident project, I did it on alopecia areata in horses. And going back through 45 years of records, I came up with about 14 horses. So that's how rare it is, and even rarer in dogs. Um, and obviously the um, endocrine testing was normal. Um, so this is a picture of alopecia areata here, and this is the hair bulb. Um, and then infiltrating the hair bulb, we have lymphocytes. And this is actually a pretty hard diagnosis to make histologically because that's the active phase of alopecia areata. But often by the time you're biopsying it, it's not in the active phase anymore. And so those changes aren't there. So sometimes you just have to make that diagnosis clinically. Um, as far as treatment goes, um, a lot of the time they will um, potentially resolve. So often we just put a sweater on them if they've got hair on their head and they'll look completely normal for 12 months and then suddenly the hair will grow back. Um, people have used steroids. I've never found steroids are helpful. Um, cyclosporin does seem to be helpful. And then um, the other thing is, um, in some cases of alopecia areata, um, they'll have focal lesions um, and then you can use topical tacrolimus and that seems to be pretty helpful as well. Um, so this was our dog uh, before any treatment, and this was our oh. dog after. <laughs> Looks completely different, doesn't it? So those owners were actually um, happier after the second time they saw me than the first time. Um, oh, cyclosporin. Yeah, so five migs per kg once a day. I rarely go higher than five migs per kg once a day with cyclosporin. Um, so I think the thing to remember in this one is pets are allowed to have more than one disease at a time and um, we don't have a lot of data on alopecia areata in dogs but at least in horses that were diagnosed over that time frame they usually had some sort of other disease going on so whether alopecia areata is triggered by stress potentially um, and it may have been so in this case um, and so if things aren't going the way you think they should be never be afraid to um, do a skin biopsy and some further testing um, so this one here is also um, an interesting case. So this was an older cat and the cat was really prudic and it had only been going on for one month and um, no one else had any lesions and um, uh, everything else about the cat seemed okay. Um, any differentials for a 12 year old prudic cat that has zero history of skin disease? Flea allergy, potentially they can get flea allergies at any age. I think that's definitely a good differential to have on the list or potentially a food allergy. Um, probably not atopic unless they've had a significant geographical move. And then, you know, other things like dermatophytes, mites, all those sorts of things should be on there. And I um, mean, any older itchy dog or cat, I think it's important to have some sort of neoplastic process on the list as well. Um, so this is our cat here, not looking fabulous. So lots of, um, 
little uh, patchy kind of alopecia and the skin kind of looks a bit funny to you. Um, so this was the belly of the cat and that's not just the light kind of reflecting off it, that belly actually was glistening. So um, that's a pretty unusual finding in a cat. Anyone getting any other ideas of what could potentially be going on at this stage? Yeah, we'll keep going. Um, so this is another cat here, so glistening belly and they often get a lot of erythema and then they can get secondary uh, pyodermas and malassezia because they're super itchy and doing a lot of over grooming. Um, and this was the foot pads of the cat. So the foot pads are cracked. And um, I mean, I think that most of us um, probably wouldn't have seen a cat with foot pads that look like this, extremely uncommon in cats. So differentials here, food allergy. Um, pemphigus foliaceus maybe, but in cats, pemphigus foliaceus tends to be very facial. Um, and they also tend to have lesions on their claws rather than their foot pads. So that would make that diagnosis a little bit less likely. Um, internal neoplasia, I think, is definitely a good differential. Um, ectoparasites, maybe, and then hypothyroidism, potentially, but I can't explain how most of those things would cause lesions on the foot pads. Um, so, the next step, um, essentially, was all, most of these things. So, scrapings were negative. Um, skin biopsy just showed mini hair follicles, and we've got a nice picture of that coming next. And unfortunately, the abdominal ultrasound showed that the um, cat had a pancreatic mass with mets to the liver. Um, so, this kind of clinical picture is really pathognomonic for um, pancreatic adenocarcinomas. So, glistening abdomen of the cat, pruritic cat, older cat, sudden onset, um, it's most commonly that disease. And um, in this histology here, these sebaceous glands look absolutely giant. So the hair follicles should look much larger than the sebaceous glands. Um, and so what we've got is very small hair follicles. And that um, is often the only histological finding in these cases. Um, so this cat was euthanized and we've got some nice pictures here. So we've got a pancreatic mass and then uh, mets to the liver and also the omentum there too. Um, so, um, the most uh, important reason for highlighting this case was just because this cluster of signs um, is almost 100% um, um, always going to be a pancreatic um, lesion. So, glistening skin on the abdomen um, definitely should set off alarm bells. Foot pad lesions in cat, cats, I'd certainly be worried. Um, and then the history is going to be very short. Um, this one's an interesting case. So he was an eight month old uh, chihuahua and he was not prudic. He had a little bit of ulceration on his ear margins and then um, some circular areas of alopecia as well. So this is him here, he's quite cute. Um, so alopecia around here and then ulceration on the ear tips there. Another close up of him. Um, and then some circular areas of um, alopecia and they kind of look like um, epidermal collarettes there almost. Um, any thoughts on what's going on with this little guy? Dermatophyte, I heard. It's not a bad option. No, Sarah. <laughs> She's cheated. She heard this before. Um, so we'll move on here. This is a nice close-up of him. So um, sort of annular areas of alopecia, erythema and scale. Another close-up there. So as far as differential goes, it looks very follicular centric. So um, the differentials that I would have is Demodex. And I think it's always important to rule out Demodex. Although I imagine now that everyone's using Netsguard and Prevecto, we won't see a lot of Demodex anymore. Um, I mean, I can, well, I have seen one case recently, um, but that's the first case I've seen in a while. And I used to see quite a lot of it. Um, and then dermatophytes, potentially. Um, although, um, for those of you that have seen dermatophytes in dogs, and even cats for that matter, it's so uncommon for it to cause a ring-like lesion. It's usually um, Staphylococcus if it's a ring-like lesion. Um, pyoderma, ischemic dermatopathy, maybe, because the ear tips are affected. So ischemic dermatopathy is really like areas with poor collateral blood supply. So ear tips, foot pads, tails, and they can go elsewhere on the body too. Um, and alopecia due to stress, commonly what owners think, always never the case. Um, so um, I don't think any of these diagnostic tests would be a bad idea. In fact, if we did all of them, I think that would be great. Um, the castration I don't think would help the skin, but it's eight months old and let's castrate this dog before it breathes. <laughs> Um, so skin scraping was negative um, and then we treated with antibiotics and those um, circular areas of alopecia resolved, which was great. Um, but the um, skin biopsy did show an ischemic dermatopathy um, and castration had no effect, obviously. 
Um, so with an ischemic dermatopathy, the histo is going to look similar to this in that the collagen um, of the dermis looks very, very pale um, and everything looks a little bit smaller than usual. And often these changes can be very, very subtle. Um, Ischemic dermatopathies encompass a large range of diseases, including um, dermatomyositis. And um, in the US, the most common time I saw an ischemic dermatopathy was secondary to a vaccination, and usually the rabies vaccination. Um, and it was funny because it was one particular manufacturer that we would most commonly see the ischemic dermatopathies occurring in, and we'd switch to a different manufacturer for the next rabies vaccination and wouldn't have the same reaction. Um, and then a lot of them are going to be idiopathic as well. Um, this is a case that we had in ARH uh, two weeks ago um, and I've only taken a photo of one of them mostly because they look identical and you couldn't tell a difference anyway. Um, but this was Casey um, and Casey and Elliot uh, came in to see me because um, about uh, three weeks before they came to see me, dad had noticed that they had um, some alopecia and some colour change of the hair. Um, it started with Casey and two days later Elliot developed lesions. Um, and so when we clip the areas, this is what they look like here. And that one's kind of going all down the back. Um, any thoughts as to what could have caused um, the ischemic dermatopathy in these two dogs? But yeah, vaccination's a really good one. Um, they were vaccinated about eight months before they came in. So typically if it's gonna be associated with a vaccination, it's gonna be, um, we say up to six months, but usually it's gonna be within that first month or so that you'll pick up on it. Yeah, perfect. So they both had Advocate about um, a week before they developed lesions. So um, for these guys, we think it was the Advocate and essentially it's a drug reaction. So they've had a drug reaction to the Advocate. Why they both had it, who knows? Maybe it was a batch problem and we've certainly reported it. Um, but the other thing is they are related. Maybe there's something inherently with how they process it or, or who knows, it's very, very strange. Um, Dad was just happy it wasn't ringworm. Um, and in those cases, I'm essentially not gonna treat it. Um, we're just gonna adopt a wait and see approach and not use advocate and um, preferably no topical um, flea and tick preventatives again in those cases um, and they're both doing really well. Um, if you do need to treat ischemic dermatopathies um, and the ones I generally treat, oh sorry go for it. Yeah, they've had Advocate for two and a half years before. So very unusual that they suddenly develop lesions, but you can develop drug reactions and food allergies and things like that at any time. They are more common in, um, you know, the first or the second time, sorry, the second time you've received the drug, but these guys have had it for, you know, two and a half years and never had a problem. So who knows why? Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if um, the, uh, you know, the company has had, had any others reported, um, potentially, if it just happened to be a specific batch. Um, the ones I do tend to treat are the ones that have um, the ulceration, so ear tip lesions, tails, foot pads, stuff like that. Those dogs are very, very uncomfortable. Um, and pentoxifiline um, is the treatment of choice. So how I explain it to cl uh, clients is that pentoxifiline essentially makes the red blood cells more bendy, so easily, uh, more easily able to navigate through those um, compromised blood vessels. Um, and the dose range is very large, between 15 and 30 mg per kg every eight hours. You definitely need to go up towards the higher end of that range. If you use it at 15 mg per kg, you won't notice a lot of improvement. Um, and when we say every eight hours, morning, home from work, before you go to bed is fine. A lot of owners struggle um, with the exactly every eight hours. Um, vomiting and hyperexcitability have been reported. Hyperexcitability, because it's essentially um, a caffeine type of product. I've never seen it um, when I've used it in dogs. I have seen vomiting when I've used it in cats though. Um, and so those are something I always um, make sure I let owners know. Um, Atopica has also been used before. Um, I find that usually using pentoxifiline is enough. I've rarely needed to add in Atopica in these cases, um, except there um, are potentially some reports that pentoxifiline has been associated with erythema multiforme. And I did have one dog that got erythema multiforme after I used pentoxifiline. So that dog got Atopica. Um, and then um, able to halve when given with ketoconazole. I would say that applied before we were using the compounded ketoconazole as opposed to to the, um, I mean, I'm not able to access ketoconazole at the moment. I don't know if anyone else is. Um, and then the other thing is if you've just got focal lesions, so if it's just the ear tips or just one lesion on the body um, or the tail, you can potentially use um, tacrolimus. And um, I usually get this compounded through Bova. Um, and often I'll apply it twice a day for four weeks and then reevaluate. Um, it has been reported in people to sting when it's applied. So some dogs will really resent the application. Um, and then I always just make sure the owners are wearing gloves. They don't need to be absorbing that. How am I going for time? 
okay. Um, when I spoke in Campbelltown, it was a year and a half ago now, I kept going till like 11.30. Um, and so now I always check in and make sure I'm not running over. Um, so I guess the take home lesson with this one is um, whenever you have those circular type lesions that look very follicular centric, um, the list of differentials is fairly narrow. Um, and most of the time that you see them, it's gonna be a bacterial folliculitis. That's 99% of what you'll see. Less commonly dermatophytes and demodex and even less commonly ischemic dermatopathies. But um, ischemic dermatopathies certainly exist. And I think that um, we commonly miss them um, because they do look so much like other things that we commonly see. Um, so this one is a, um, an interesting case. He's a 10 year old beagle and he's got a really long history of being an atopic dog. Um, but within the last two months, um, he seems to be doing much worse. And now he's got some pigment loss on his nose. Um, and this is him here. So looking like a bit of a washed out beagle. He's got a very red belly there, lots of patchy alopecia. And this is his nose here. Any differentials for this guy? Yeah, something autoimmune. So anytime you've got pigment drop out on the nasal plane and I have um, autoimmune disease, uh, diseases on the list, I think that's great. Um, and then the other thing to have on your list is a food allergy, although that <laughs> wouldn't explain the pigment dropout so much. But if you have a dog that's been atopic or a dog that's developed um, a prudic skin disease later in life, food allergy is a good differential. Those can happen at any age. Um, atopic dermatitis that's not well controlled, potentially. Um, SLE, maybe. Um, cutaneous lymphoma really important one to have on your list. So any older itchy dog, cutaneous lymphoma is almost at the top of my list. Um, and then scabies, dogs can develop scabies at any age, although once again, next card and brevecto, I think we're going to see a lot less scabies as well. Um, and then um, potentially DLE um, with bad atopic dermatitis. Um, so um, some of these had already been done before the dog came to see me. We'll just skip to the next slide. So um, they did a hypoallergenic diet and there was no change. Antihistamines, no change, not surprising. I don't think um, they work that well in most cases. Um, ANA test was negative, doesn't rule out SLE. Um, and then the skin biopsy did show cutaneous lymphoma. Um, so my rule of thumb is any older itchy dog, um, whether they've had a long-standing history of atopic dermatitis or whether it's a new skin disease, if there is pigment dropout on the nose and sometimes pigment dropout on the foot pads around the mucocutaneous junctions, those dogs all need to be biopsied because um, it is commonly cutaneous lymphoma. Um, and it is generally in older dogs, although I had a two-year-old dog here that we diagnosed cutaneous lymphoma in, so it's not unheard of to see it. Um, and then another dog, one and a half years old, um, had had um, a, a lesion that literally just looked like a hot spot on the side of its face. Um, it was cutaneous lymphoma. So um, always important to biopsy if things aren't progressing the way they should be. And there's a range of lesions here because cutaneous lymphoma is the great mimicker. It can look like whatever it wants to. So it can look like epidermal cholerets, it can be nodular, you can just have depigmentation. Um, it really has a broad range of presentations, but in most cases, these dogs will be pruritic. Um, so this is another dog with cutaneous lymphoma here. So more scale and alopecia. Um, and then this is the mucocutaneous junctions here. So that's a really commonly affected area and you tend to get a lot of secondary infection too. Um, and these are the foot pads. So lots of pigment drop out there and then some little ulcers forming. That's a more severely affected one. Um, this is a cat with cutaneous lymphoma. So not quite as dramatic as some of the dogs that we've seen, um, but older itchy scaly cats certainly have cutaneous lymphoma on your list. Uh, it's a rabbit with cutaneous lymphoma. Another case here, and then some close up of some, yeah, it's pretty sad. And then a ferret. We had a lot of um, exotics at UC Davis and um, I don't like anything smaller than a cat. Um, so I was always gowned and gloved when I went in to see them. Um, and then another case here. So you can just have single lesions as well. It doesn't need to be a generalized disease. Um, so as far as treatment goes, um, you, you can use a combination of synthetic retinoids and prednisolone and that'll work well in some cases. So um, this is a case that we use that in here. So this is one month after treatment and then three months after treatment. Um, I think almost always these cases relapse. Um, it's very, very rare to have one go on and do fabulously without needing more treatment. Um, the treatment of choice is lamustine. Um, 
it's really important to monitor neutrophils. It's very common for them to become neutropenic. Um, and this is a case that we use lamustine in here. So um, a couple of little lesions there looking much better after therapy. Um, I think the longest I've had one go without needing another round of treatment was nine months. Um, and generally, in my experience, when I treat them a second time, they don't tend to respond as well. Um, it's very rare for cutaneous lymphoma to metastasize, um, but usually the dogs are euthanized for quality of life. Um, you can use, uh, for focal lesions, you could potentially use um, topical um, products, but really expensive, $1,000 a tube. So um, it, at the end of the day, a lot of clients aren't going to go for that. Um, once again, cutaneous lymphoma is the great mimicker. So um, always take a biopsy if you're not sure. Older itchy dogs, skin disease, take a biopsy and rule out cutaneous lymphoma. It's more common than I think we think it is. And I tend to get them in clusters. Like some weeks I'll diagnose 10 of them and then I'll have a break where I don't see any of them at all. Um, so we'll do this one quickly. So 11 year old um, cat with a four month history of um, pruritus, alopecia and scaling. No other pets in the household. So this is our cat here. Definitely a lot of alopecia, definitely a lot of scale, looking pretty unhappy. Um, so whenever you see a scaly cat, I always think of thymomas. So cats that have thymomas tend to get a ton of scale. Um, Chylotiella also causes a lot of scale. We've just spoken about cutaneous lymphoma, so I'd definitely have that on my list. Um, Pemphigus is a consideration, but that tends to be more crusty as opposed to scaly. Um, and then maybe a food allergy too. Um, so, the next step with this cat fungal culture was negative. There was no response to ivermectin um, and the skin biopsy, I always hate these biopsy reports. Perivascular chronic dermatitis is the most useless information a pathologist can give you. Um, and then chest x-rays were negative, so no thymoma, but a hypoallergenic diet, that cat resolved and improved within six weeks. So this is the cat before, that's the cat after. Pretty amazing, right? So um, as far as hypoallergenic diets in cats, um, I do prefer um, home-cooked diets. So I'll usually just get the owners to do uh, cooked kangaroo meat, plus or minus a bit of pumpkin if the cat will eat it. Um, if I do um, a commercial diet, I usually use Royal Cannon hypoallergenic. I tend find that's a bit better tolerated than ZD. I don't know about you guys, but I tend to see a lot of GI signs when I'm using Hill ZD in cats. Um, but home-cooked if the owners will do it. Um, so food allergy, once again, can look like anything. Um, and um, as far as other differentials for scaly cats go, thymomas and cutaneous lymphomas. So any sort of scaling skin disease, um, think of thymomas and cutaneous lymphoma in cats, um, in addition to chylotiella and food allergies. Um, when we were at UC Davis, we used to see a lot of um, thymomas in rabbits as well with scaling. Um, this one we won't go through. If anyone wants the slides, um, you're more than welcome to uh, grab a copy from us um, and we can share them. I'll just show you his pictures really quickly. So this is the dog here um, and I'm gonna summarize it in about two sentences. He looks really awful, really, really itchy, really erythematous. Um, we did all the tests you can possibly imagine. That's him before. That's him after. I have no idea what's wrong with him, but cyclosporin fixed him. <laughs> wasn't atopic, wasn't food allergic, didn't have lymphoma, didn't have scabies, didn't have demodex. I have no, no contact allergies. I don't know what was going on with him. That's him before, that's him after. Yeah. So looking much better. Um, and I think that was it. Oh, and this, we'll just do this one quickly only because he's really cool. So his name was Awesome Dude and he was a little dog um, and he presented for alopecia and pruritus and this was his disgusting crusty leg. It's pretty awful. And that's his feet there looking absolutely awful. So it looks really mangy to me. Like I would thought it was Demodex. So that dog definitely needs to be scraped. That's face. Um, and so, um, Demodex, pyodermis, fungal, lymphoma, pemphigus, I think those are all really good differentials. Um, so, this dog actually ended up having trichophyton, and the reason I highlight him is any sort of Jack Russell Terrier type dog that has crusting disease, often on their feet and often on their face, it's trichophyton until proven otherwise. And um, it's very, very common for these dogs to be biopsied, and the diagnosis will come back as pemphigus foliaceous, because histologically it looks exactly the same as pemphigus foliaceous, because the fungal uh, trichophyton will release enzymes that will also cause acanthalysis, so breakdown of the adhesion of the keratinocytes. 
um, and um, you don't always see the trichophyte in organisms histologically. So you do need to culture these cases and um, also make sure the pathologist applies special stains and they don't always do that. So if I'm suspicious that something might be infectious, I write on my request form, please do special stains for mycobacteria or for fungal organisms or whatever to make sure they do it. You guys all have my contact details and hopefully everyone has my um, number and email. So if you have any questions later on, feel free to send me an email. Um, and then um, you can go to Vet Talk TV to listen to it all again. Or if you want me to drop box you the slides, I can do that as well. All right, I think Parnell's going to say a few words now.